Marilyn Robinson wrote and published the book Gilead in 2004. She won both the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction the next year. The letters that 76-year-old Reverend John Ames writes for his little son to read after his death make up the book. John's letters include recollections, everyday happenings, and comments on existence and religion. He starts by considering how much he will miss his time on earth, although he didn't feel at home in the world when he was younger, living alone after being widowed, but having a wife and child has changed that. One of his greatest regrets is that he remarried so late in life and hasn't done anything to prepare for the future, leaving his kid and wife, Leela, in a vulnerable situation. John Ames was born in 1880 in Kansas. Both his father and grandfather were clergymen. He spent 74 of his 76 years in Gilead, Iowa. As a 12-year-old, he visited his grandfather's cemetery in Kansas. In his old age, his grandpa had left Gilead and gone back to Kansas, where he had previously battled for abolition during the turbulent years leading up to the Civil War. John's father and grandpa separated bitterly and never reconciled before his death. John's father felt driven to go to his father's grave because of this. After a long, thirsty, dusty trek, John and his father discovered the overgrown cemetery and did their best to tidy it up. Then, on his father's grave, John's father said a prayer of repentance to God. John will always remember the breathtaking moonrise and sunset he saw during the prayer. While at seminary, John married a childhood friend, Louisa. After that, they relocated to Gilead, where John succeeded his father as preacher. However, Louisa died shortly after giving birth, and their newborn daughter, Rebecca, lasted just a few hours. He considers the next decades a lengthy, painful prayer. Even though he was lonely, he found meaning and comfort in study as he produced hundreds of pages of sermons. John was 67 when Leela strolled into his church on Pentecost and changed everything. John remembers his elder brother, Edward, who, while pursuing his PhD in Germany, became an atheist. When Edward got back home, he attempted to undermine John's faith by recommending skeptic books, but it didn't work. John liked the books and maintained his faith. He explains to his kid that authors like the atheist philosopher Feuerbach are not dangerous and that when people's beliefs are disturbed, it's typically because they deliberately want to do so. John considers the past sermons stacked around the home and realizes that the sermon he is most proud of was not one he ever really delivered. During the Spanish flu pandemic, he preached that the disease was God's warning against World War I. He burned the sermon, thinking it was useless. John remembers his odd, saintly grandpa, who generously gave away the family's assets to anybody who needed them while he considers the certain poverty his wife and kid would experience after his passing. He recalls his grandpa telling him about a vision he had as a young man in which he was instructed to go to Kansas and join the abolitionists, recalling his grandpa as a restless prophet from the Old Testament who constantly seemed to have been struck by lightning. However, John's father never placed much trust in miracles or visions. John wants his child to understand that his son's very existence is a miracle in his eyes. He often ponders the miracle of life these days and wishes his kid will live a long life and appreciate the earth. Heaven will be unimaginably glorious and endure forever, but in some strange way it just makes the passing glories of this life more beautiful. John's closest friend Borton, Gilead's retired Presbyterian preacher, has debilitating arthritis. One day Glory Borton, John's daughter, stops by to let him know that her brother Jack, also called John Ames Borton, will soon be arriving from St. Louis. John has always found Jack challenging, despite the fact that Borton wanted Jack to have a particular bond with John, 
who has been childless for most of his life. John is unsure of what to say to his son about the guy since he has caused his family a lot of pain. He talks about his grandfather's attempts to assist free soilers get the right to vote in Kansas so the state could join the Union. During the Civil War, he lost an eye in combat. However, John's father never favored discussing those times. He remembers how, after his grandfather's passing, he assisted his father in destroying his grandfather's antique revolver since the mere thought of it made his father angry. He recalls the divide that developed between his father and grandpa when the latter left his son's sermon one day. His grandparents disdained his son's pacifism, while John's father considered war abhorrent and thought his father abandoned the family to assist abolitionists. John's father had even stopped going to his grandfather's church after the Civil War and started attending Quaker services. John now feels his grandfather's single-mindedness was both his strength and his downfall. John recalls a memory to his son. His father was assisting a group of individuals in dismantling a church that had been burnt by lightning. As they labored in the warm rain, everyone sang hymns, as a mucky cookie was offered to him by his father. The recollection captures the struggle and delight of those times. He remembers his father telling him about a story from when he was a little child. In the middle of the night, John's grandpa left on a horseback without stating his destination. Later, John's father saw a soldier sitting in the chapel with a limp, and he assumed that his father had shot the soldier. John's father believed the guy had passed away when he never showed up again and was repulsed by his role in concealing John's grandfather's secret. John feels obligated to warn his wife and kid about Jack Borton, but he is unsure of what to say. He is starting to feel the physical effects of stress. Jack keeps asking John if someone can be sent to hell repeatedly during a discussion they are having on Borton's front porch one day. John feels that Jack is testing him and isn't taking him seriously, but Leela feels Jack's distress. John thinks it's time to record Jack's narrative since he can't sleep. He reveals that when Jack was in college, he became involved with a young, homeless lady, and as a consequence, they had a baby. John thinks it's unfair that Jack informed his parents about the young lady and her child since he refused to do anything to help them. The Bortons struggled to provide their ill granddaughter with financial support although she lived in filth, but their efforts were in vain. The infant died of an infection at age three. In the 20 years that have passed, John has never been able to forgive Jack for squandering his parenthood or to have hope for Jack's future success. Jack soon requests to meet John at the chapel. There, Jack acknowledges that he has never been able to conjure any religious feelings, making it unclear if he wants to be converted to Christianity. The argument ends in frustration, and John later muses that he has never found it useful to dispute with doubters since doing so typically just serves to confirm their suspicions. John is aware that he hasn't yet told his son the story of how he and Leela met. One Sunday, Leela showed up at church without warning, and John couldn't stop thinking about her. He even started composing sermons with her in mind during the following weeks. Given their age gap, with Leela 30 years younger than him, he had never previously felt this intense desire and distraction, besides feeling silly. When Leela eventually contacted him for baptism, John taught her the fundamentals of the faith before baptizing her. She eventually started visiting his home on occasion to take care of his gardening. When he asked her one day how he might return her compassion, she said, you could get married to me. He acknowledged that it was the most exhilarating experience of his life. One day, Jack catches John off guard in his church study by presenting him with a photograph of Jack posing beside a black lady and a son of light color, his spouse and youngster. He says that he is bringing John the news because he is concerned that Borton is too frail to handle it. 
Eight years have passed since they started dating, but owing to anti miscegenation laws in Missouri and Della's father's opposition, they have only sometimes shared a home. As a result, Jack has found it difficult to support his family. They were able to survive for a time in a neighborhood in St. Louis that was home to people of many races, but when John got into conflict with his employer, He left his wife and kid back to her Tennessee family and traveled to Gilead to see if they might find a better life there. But for now, it's not even obvious whether Della wants to continue living together. John is at a loss for words when asked whether he believes that they could live in Gilead. He envelops Jack and sincerely compliments him on being a genuine person. Days later, after finding out that Della has rejected him, Jack gets ready to permanently leave Gilead, even though it is obvious that his father is in jeopardy of passing away. Jack accepts John's invitation to enjoy God's blessing as they make their way to the bus stop. While Borton would have loved to have met Jack's kid, Robert Borton Miles, John wishes his friend could have been around to experience it. John muses on how the world, especially in remote, modest locations like Gilead, brilliantly displays God's beauty. In his last letter, he promises his child that he will pray for him to be courageous as he grows up and that he will find a way to be helpful, he'll pray, then he'll go to sleep. If you have any suggestion of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.